Hello and welcome to another episode of Fintech Focus TV with me, Toby Babb. Uh, as you know, this program isn't just about the fintech space. We're looking to build uh, leadership and take lessons from sport, business, military. And today I am delighted to be joined by someone uh, who I've been a big fan of for a long, long time. Uh, this goes back to my days as a, as a sort of late teenager uh, for the mighty Liverpool Football Club. It's David Thompson. David, how are you? I'm good. Thanks, Toby. Um, it's a pleasure to be on here, mate. Thanks for having me. Great to have you on. David Thompson, uh, former Liverpool uh, superstar, one of my favourite players uh, when, I was, uh, when I was growing up and coming through, coming through the ranks. Um, listen, it's really, it's, we've just been talking about this. Liverpool have ended 30 years of hurt. Uh, we're both big Liverpool fans and uh, it's, been, it's been magic to see them win it, huh? It's been unreal, actually. It's, uh, it was a little bit of an anti-climax, because obviously because of COVID-19, but um, what a, a marvellous achievement for the whole squad, the whole team. I mean, ever since Jurgen Klopp took over, it's been moving in the right direction. And, uh, you know, it was very disappointing last year to lose out not winning the Premier League after finishing the way we did with 97 points, you know, a record points total. And, and you know, a, a points total that would normally win you the league by a country mile. Almost uh, any other year, done, wasn't it? And we got done by one point, which um, we made up for it by winning the Champions League. But it just showed you the way the club was, was heading, the direction of the club. Um, and I say the club, it's not just the team, it's a whole club. Um, we'll talk about this a bit later on, but the whole recruitment, the whole business strategy, FSG, what they've done there and what they've implemented. I think, you know, from when they took over this club, it was on the verge of bankruptcy. And I don't think people realised how close it was to going into bankruptcy. And, uh, you know, they've come in and done an unbelievable job and turned it into a global brand and a very successful global brand. Yeah, I think that's the, that's the key thing I want to talk about. Look, this is a... This show's predominantly been talking to people about the, the sort of fintech industry, but one of the things I really want to do is say, look, how can fintech and, uh, and businesses learn from sports and, uh, and the military and, and all, all various other forms of life? And I think there's so many lessons here that come from how FSG and Liverpool have done this, and that's what I really want to focus in on. Look, you've been uh, at the highest level of, uh, of, of the, you know, the football world. You've seen various uh, dynasties come through in that Liverpool stage. You nearly got there you know, with... with uh, under the Julier era yourself um, and the team you know, got to, uh, to heady heights at various different stages, but just missed out. As you say, there is a, you know, with the former owners um, and the, the, you know, the club going into near bankruptcy, the, the, you know, FSG inherited something there, which needed to compete against much, much wealthier clubs in Chelsea, Man United and, uh, and, and, and various others, Man City. Uh, and I've been doing it with a little bit of a hand tied behind the back, but there's a nine-year strategy here that I think has been fascinating in, in, in how it comes out and results in, in this, uh, you know, this, this, this title that's been waited for 30 years with a manager there who's, who's absolutely revolution, revolutionised the playing style. But I'm really interested in what happens behind it. Tell us your take on, on, on how FSG have done it. Well, obviously, they've in, implemented some uh, very strict business practices and, um, you know, only them themselves will know what they've done. Um, you know, this, that's something that I've not got access to and I can't comment on, but obviously, you know, they've been very strict in, in the way they've gone about the businesses, the refinancing and loans and et cetera, et cetera. But one of the biggest things that, that's obviously coincided with the recruitment, when they got Jürgen Klopp, they got a natural born leader, someone who was, who's, whose leadership skills were, were demonstrated through his total honesty. Um, very. Um, this is a guy that's full of integrity, full of honesty, um, but also very passionate and very intelligent and so enthusiastic. I think I read a quote the other day that the, the, the way the lads come into training, it doesn't matter what mood they're in, as soon as they see the gaffer, it's just full of enthusiasm and it's so warm and they just love to be there. They love to mm. learn, they love to go in, you know, and that's the, that's the culture he sets in the club. But Coinciding with that is um, a guy that I'm familiar with who was at Portsmouth with me when I was at Portsmouth, who was the pro zone analysis guy, was the, was the, who's now recruit, head of recruitment and uh, the director of recruitment at Liverpool is a guy called Michael Edwards. Mm -hmm. And a uh, very intelligent guy, very funny, um, witty guy, but a very focused guy, knows exactly what he wants. And... Uh, 
some of the recruitments that they've brought into the team now has been absolutely out of this world. I mean, to, to pick up the likes of Mo Salah, Sadio Mane, Virgil van Dijk, James Milner on a free transfer, Alisson, Robbo. I mean, oh my God. And not only that, right? Not only the sales that we've brought in, the exodus that we've sent out over the, mm. over the last three seasons, we've made money on players who've not performed. We've actually got money back uh, on players who've not performed, in, in fact, performed very poorly. Um, and we've managed to recoup the money back. When I was coming through the ranks at Liverpool, Liverpool was a club who paid top heavy for, uh, for players and sold them at bottom prices. Mm. Uh, and that is ultimately going to, t- going to take its toll on the club. And uh, it's a similar situation to where Manchester United are at the moment. Um, you know, especially when you don't get Champions League football, you have to overspend and you start taking risks. You can't buy the, these ready-made players like you, you know, you'd like to go out and buy. You have to invest. You have to make a real strategic investment. You, you, know, you have to buy players that you think are potentially going to be world-class, but then it comes with risk. Because you know you're paying over the top to to you know incite these players to come and play for you. You're having to give them astro- astronomical wages because you're not supplementing that with Champions League. And if it works out, great. But if it doesn't work out, it takes it takes its uh, its toll on the, the club's bottom line. Mm. So I think the recruitment strategy, what Liverpool have been doing for the last five years since they brought in Michael Edwards, has just been out of this world it's been spot on don't get me wrong they've made a few mistakes but you're going to get Not mistakes many. <laughs> but ultimately the su- success stories I think that the net spend for Liverpool over the last um, two seasons or three seasons is something like um, £70 million pound. I think the net spend for Man City is 500 Yeah. you know our, our net spend is the equivalent to Watford Yeah. and we've just won the league by a country mile um, the club's also just released record figures um, for, for turnover globally. It's just absolutely um, a marvellous achievement by the whole club, not just um, Jurgen Klopp, not just the players on the pitch. It's you know the, the, the people, the directors, the board of directors and uh, FSG, uh, the owners, have, have done an absolutely superb job and they deserve a lot of credit for that. I agree with that. I think there's so many different things you can pick up from from you know what Michael Edwards has done and and uh, you know his his you know he, again not bought into that sporting director position. He's accelerated into that because of what he's been able to achieve. And yeah, you, know, you talk there about players who've been shipped out who haven't necessarily performed, but there's also been this sort of bring players in and, and uh, low and sell them high. Mm-hmm. So you know when Liverpool have have uh, you know even Coutinho when you talk about the reinvestment of uh, one of the star players there to go into Alisson and Van Dijk and how you sort of make that money and, and shore up the, the sort of areas of the team that really need it. That was inspired. And uh, you know, other, other players like um, you know, Jordan and I have been those sort of players who, who have moved on to Bournemouth who, who seem to have taken on a lot of, <laughs> inherited a lot of that. I, I, well, of look, when you look at it now, Toby, you look, you know, we got 20 million for Jordan Ibe and he's, 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 not, he's not performed at all at Bournemouth. Now, uh, he, uh, the same with um, Solanke. Solanke as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We got, 18 million, I think, for Solanke. Uh, the 30 million we got back for Benteke is just, um, you know, seven, eight years ago, we wouldn't have been able to recoup this money. But the, the, the situation that it is, Liverpool, have, you know, because they've had success on, on, with other transfers, it's put them in a better position to be in a, a, you know, a bargaining. Put them in a better bargaining position, I'd say, because they've yeah. had success with certain transfers. So, you know, they're not as desperate to sell, but they, you know, even letting uh, Sacco go. I mean, if you yeah. watch Sacco on the weekend, the money we got for Sacco, I think we got 20 million back for him, was, um, you know, you wouldn't, you, watching him on Saturday, you wouldn't have paid 1 million for him. <laughs> but at the same time, you talk about, you know, the decision to sell uh, Philip Coutinho. When they did actually sell him, there was a lot of panic and desperation from the Liverpool fans because they wanted to spend that money straight away in that transfer window. They wanted to go and sign Virgil van Dijk. The fact that we didn't sign him, we had to wait another six months for him. We didn't go and buy somebody else because we couldn't get him. You know, yeah. we, we waited. He's the player that fits the criteria. You know, they've got a lot of 
computer analysis and um, sports science and sports uh, computer science guys, you know, put a lot of effort into these um, the numbers. And if you're hitting yeah. the numbers and you fit the criteria, you're you're a good player and you're going to buy into the work ethic. You know, once you're on Liverpool's radar, I think they will um, they'll hunt you down until they get you. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a really important aspect, and it goes goes across to you know to business as much as it does football. Look, you you, you can either uh, buy someone because they're available, or you wait for the right sort of thing. I think characterise that's that's throughout the club. You know, Lee Richardson, the um, uh, uh, sports psychologist, they they didn't just get any sports psych in there. Klopp waited for two years to find someone who he really trusted and bought into his philosophy. Yeah. Um, you know, you look at Van, you know, Van D- Allison. You know, they waited for a long time, and they'd have gone through with Carrius and Mingale if they if they needed to to uh, to wait until they had the right person rather than just the person. I think they were talking about Pickford for a little while, um, and, and uh, they waited for Allison, who was the best in the world, rather than just someone who can fill the thing. And I think that that concept of just waiting for the right person is so so important in in uh, in what's made them you know go where they, where they want to be. And he won't just hire for the sake of hiring or, or bring people in for the sake of bringing people in. It's who's going to improve, like to improve the team. <laughs> well, there you go. There's a link in there somewhere. There's a link in there somewhere. Boom, boom. <laughs> Listen, you, I'm also, you, you touched on it earlier on, and I know that you've been in, in, um, in spots where, um, where you, you've seen different cultures of success and, and teams doing better and worse at various different stages. This team's characterised by its culture, right? You, you mentioned earlier on that it's a team that people love coming into the uh, the training ground, love playing for each other. It's very, very clear that it's the team that, that fight for each other. What's the, what's what's that mean? What's the, what's the spirit to that? What can you? you know, where, where, why do you think culture is such an important aspect of uh, of a high performance team? Well, I think if you're going to create an environment where you want to thrive and be successful, you have to create a culture or allow a culture where people are happy. You know, you've got to allow them to come in and be themselves. Um, I think that's one thing that Jurgen Klopp is, uh, is superb at. And, uh, you know, you've got to get, have, a, have a culture where people can identify with. And I heard it the other day, you know, if you look at that Liverpool team, uh, doesn't matter what shirt, what colour shirt they had on. You know, if you watch them play, you, would see, you didn't know who they were, but, you, you know, it was, it was just an unidentifiable shirt. You turn around and say, that's a Liverpool team. Mm. You know, it's something that you can identify with. They look happy. They work hard. You know, they work hard for each other. You know, you look at the, the, the captain of the team in Jordan Henderson. You know, he had a, a tough task in, you know, standing into Stevie Gerrard's boots. Stevie was a, a real leader by example. Uh, you know, he, he, very quiet man on the pitch, quite quiet off it, but he led by example. Jordan's a bit different. I think, you know, he rallies round, he gets the lads together. You know, he does it with a smile on his face. You know, he's not mm. aggressive. You know, it, I think the lads buy into it because they want to be part of that journey. They want to mm. be part of that culture. And that's, it's important that you allow people to be themselves. You know, you don't often hear Liverpool players berating each other. You don't hof- often hear them talking bad about each other. You don't see them arguing on the pitch. They look like a team. A t- they create a togetherness. They've got a unity. And uh, it's exemplary. And you look at it. And uh, I think if you asked any football player throughout the Premier League which manager they'd want to play for, mm. I think the majority of them would turn around and say, I'd love to play for Jürgen, Kopp, Jürgen Klopp. Uh, I would, you know, as a retired yeah. footballer, I'm sure if you ask John Barnes, Ian Rush, Robbie Fowler, who's the manager they'd love to play for? I think it's Jürgen Klopp. But that guy, you could put him as president of, of prime minister of this country, president of Germany, president of America, you know, and the whole country would buy into this guy. You know, he's yeah. a real nice, honest um, human being. And I think... Um, you know, they're real positives and, and, and that's been important in creating the culture at Liverpool Football Club. And you've played for some, for some managers of real note throughout, you know, throughout all your career. What's, what, what sort of the things which you've seen that, that can really make a difference? I mean, Klopp there, you talk about some of it, the, the sort of human characteristics. And I think, um, or is it Mike Gordon was saying that he's the sort of player who, you know, it was sort of guy that if he was the, the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, he'd, he'd be... You know the the uh, a classic CEO and a great boss to you know for people to work with whatever he's doing. Where, where's you know when people have really performed and, and got the best out of you? What, what's uh, what's been the secret to leadership that you've seen there? 
I would say when, when people are honest with you and they treat you like uh, a human being uh, and, and not just a piece of meat and, you know, they want to get to know you inside out personally, what makes you tick. I think Graham Suness was fantastic at this and, uh, you know, given, given a second chance, you know, I heard uh, Ian Rush talk about this the other day. He thinks that Suness now would be, uh, you know, just as successful as Jürgen Klopp. Now, I don't know whether, you know, uh, he's correct in that analysis, just as successful, but I can see Graham being, being very successful um, in the way he handles players and the way he was. You know, he allowed you to go be yourself. He allowed you to go and express yourself and be yourself around the training ground as well. Um, so... It's, uh, so the soonest thing to me is interesting because because you know he does get you know he's a great um, person for driving standards he's uh, you know comes across really well the issue that that he had quite clearly to me was was again a recruitment issue right because you look at who he bought in and who he got rid of it was a uh, you know I think I remember him sort of inheriting that sort of golden generation of people like Ray Houghton and and all those sort of players who who mm-hmm. were let go pretty quickly and then they were replaced in with. People who weren't necessarily Liverpool players, Paul Stewart, you know, Julian Dix, uh, that sort of that, you know, those were his original signings. And again, it just shows the importance of having, you know, in, in collecting that right team at that sort of stage, which drives the culture. And one of the things that Liverpool's culture seems to be uh, great about is, is, is they are selecting at the moment people who seem to be really good human beings, right? Really yeah. good people. And I think that's probably, you know, if you look at the, you know, the most successful. Um, period of that, you know, before that, in that Julio Roy Evans side, is there was a bunch of people there who were good, good, all came through with you at the same sort of time. Dominic mm-hmm. Matteo, um, you know, you, you had you set yourself, Cara, uh, Stephen Gerrard. That, that's a great core of people, local lads who were, were good, Absolutely. good lads, right? You're all good lads. Uh, we, we were unfortunate, really, that um, the, the time that we were coming through, you know, Liverpool had just come off the back of you know, a fairly unsuccessful era, even though they've been successful in the past, you know, in late, late 80s, early 90s. And then they had that little barren spell where they won, you know, FA Cup and um, the League Cup. But uh, I think we just lost touch of the, the winning mentality. Um, mm. You know, they've been through a transitional period. And, you know, you've just touched on it before. I think the recruitment was... Um, Certainly, from my time when we when I was coming through uh, as a young YTS at the time, the recruitment was not good. It was not good. Uh, we were paying top end prices and selling low. You know when it was unsuccessful. You know and it, it, that carried on for quite a long time. And even under Benitez and Julie, you know they they were not actually too far away from mm. creating yeah, this again. Chance again, wasn't it? Yeah. It just comes down to the you know when they did win the treble back in two thousand and one, and when they you know, they won the Champions League in 2005. I think there should have been a recruitment push after that, but they didn't. And um, I think if they had the facilities in place, like like your Michael Edwards now, who would have had someone identified um, already and, and been able to, you know, bring something else to the table, bring something else to the squad, they might have been able to sustain that challenge. But that's the difference now. It's not just Liverpool... Winning the uh, winning the league or winning the Champions League or winning an FA Cup, they actually they're creating a winning mentality that looks like it's going to be instilled for a long time. And also they've got the recruitment in place. They keep adding to the squad year on year, and uh, you know they're doing things right. If it's not right, it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit into the business strategy. They won't proceed with it. But if it does, they're going to improve the squad and they can resell the, the you know maybe the player, getting them at the right age, the right time. You know, and they're going to have a resale value, then they'll bring them in. But this is what makes me think that Liverpool are on the beginning of a dynasty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's an interest because if you look at it, and and uh, you know, going back to FSG and how they sort of approach this, they they uh, they've got a blueprint with what they did with the Red Sox in Boston over in, over in Boston. This is this isn't something which has come from nowhere. They identified the right coach who was going to be there and, and perform above the uh, expectations of which they wanted to do. Yeah. You know, if you if you do if you watch Moneyball, they see him sort of trying to get um, Billy Bean at that sort of stage, and it's and it's all it's all part of a of a plan. And and I remember reading it. I've got it here in front of me. These are the four things they said they wanted to do when they first took over uh, back in 2015. So attract the best players. Number one. Number two, turn losses into wins. Number three, compete for trophies. And and four, create a culture of winning. You spoke about a culture of winning there, and how you lose it and, and you gain it at various different stages. And under under soon as it potentially just went went away a little bit. 
to lose you know lose sight of what it meant to be serial winners and have that legacy of winning. And right now that dynasty is about you know fundamentally having the best players. If you've got the best players, you're going to win win more games than other people. Now best players is sometimes by the superstars, the Galactico way. Um, or you could do it in a different way and, and hire on character and find the, find the right sort of people who are going to fit the mould of what you want to do. And I think yeah. that's what they've done brilliantly. They've identified players there who've clearly got that same sort of work rate. And, and Henderson is a classic, classic example. Milner was a, was a genius signing, right, as a, as a free transfer. Uh, you know, for the, for the thing, even Adam Lalana and the, what he seems to have brought to the squad in terms of just you know, being around it. Oxley Chamberlain, another sort of character there. These are good characters who are building up a culture they then all fit in together to attract more players. And once you've got a, a coach there who people want to play for, you've got people who have got a culture of winning. They've got people in there who they think they can learn from and have a good time working with. It becomes something which is a real magnet around it, doesn't it, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, just looking at it now, I think, you know, if, if, if you went up and down the Premier League, I think that there's, there's players now who would actually sign for Liverpool and take a pay cut to come and play for Liverpool. Yeah. And play yeah. for Jurgen Klopp, and uh, that's a real special situation. A real credit to Klopp and the backroom team and FSG, and what they've created is is something. It's that the players want to be a part of. They would really, I mean, that Jurgen Klopp is such an enthusiastic, magnetic human being, and there's not many of them around. Some people, he's so positive, and you know, he, he doesn't criticize many many people. His enthusiasm is so infectious, and it rubs yeah. off on you. And you can see he's a motivator. He, he's just yeah. a motivator. And the hugs that he goes on, he runs straight onto the pitch to give the lads a hug. He claps all the fans. You know, this is not just for show. This is actual, yeah. genuinely from the heart. Yeah, that honesty is is um, you know it's so heartwarming, and everybody wants to be a part of that. You feel it when you when you're actually there as well, wasn't it? I mean, look, that that famous uh, West Brom uh, bow to the crowd after a two-two at Anfield, uh, late equaliser, just doing the symbolic part of actually bringing the crowd into it, and and sort of genuinely becoming the twelfth man on it. You feel it when you're actually at that ground at the moment, when wow. uh, well, obviously not at the moment with, with COVID being in there, but <laughs> but when you go into, I was there for this for the City game earlier in the season, uh, and it was. Uh, it was just the most electric atmosphere I'd ever been involved in at any sort of stage, and it comes from him as well, right? It does come from him, uh, but the Liverpool fans, that, that stadium, I mean, that was another masterstroke, you know, the way they put the other tier on the stand. It's yeah, such yeah. an intimidating, it was an intimidating stadium anyway, but now it's even more imposing. When you come out that tunnel, you turn around, you face that crowd. I mean, the whole crowd is right on top of you. The cop, you know, they singing away. The whole stadium is singing, you'll never walk alone. And this was an experience that, you know, I've actually had the pleasure of walking out into the tunnel when that, you know, the whole stadium is singing, you'll, you'll never walk alone. It's a very scary, intimidating place as, as, as your own fans are singing that. So for whenever any other teams come in, it must be very intimidating and scary place to come and try and play. And yeah. I think this is why Liverpool have been so dominant as well. You know, it's, um, I actually remember turning to Cara one day uh, when the, clock, the, the cop was in um, full voice singing You'll Never Walk Alone. It was a really hot day and we were playing Arsenal and the hairs on the back of my neck were standing up. You know, it was, I was full of adrenaline. I was supercharged and Cara was the same. And I just said, turned to Cara and I said, how the fuck did we get here? You know, and it was just, we were just looking at each other thinking, this is unreal. And we went and won 2-1 that day. Uh, Robbie Fowler scored a couple of goals. Um, but it really is a scary, intimidating place. Um, great stadium it, it, to play. It's a, it's a, mag it's a magic spot. And, and, and I want to just go back to something you said there about how you, how you got there. Look, you've, you've, li you've uh, lived something that's, that's everyone's dream, right? You played for, uh, you know, played for, played for the club. Obviously, you, you, grew up, you grew up as a Liverpool fan, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. So you grew up in 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 the uh, in the city as a you know, as a big as a big Liverpool fan. You play for the club which you want. It takes an awful lot to do that. There's very very few people in you know whoever get to achieve that that sort of, that sort of thing. Tell me what it took from you to get to that sort of stage because there's so many people that don't get it, uh, who don't achieve that sort of stuff. And and for me, people who do, 
there's a special sort of psychology and mentality in that that, that allows that high performance thing to you know to, to which I think it, again is translated. So you know if you, you're there and you, you do it in any any walk of life, there are certain things which link into it. For you to have got through all of that competition in one of the biggest footballing cities in the world, with most people wanting to live that dream. What is it that you did that meant that you got to, to live that life? It's not something that I did. Well, but you, have to, you have to make sacrifices, that's for sure. Um, yeah. But that goes along with, you know, any sort of investment into your career. Um, you have to make sacrifices and you have to put the work in. But I think one of the most important things to remember uh, is how you deal with setbacks. I think everybody in life or in any career We'll, we'll get setbacks, you know, you'll come across rejection. Um, it's how you react to that rejection that will spare you on. I think there's going to be a point, you're not going to be great or get, um, you know, applaud it every week of your life or every day of your life or come the end of the year, you know, you might get let go from one job or re rejected from one club. And you might think you're not good enough. You have to have the mental strength to be able to deal with the setbacks and charge your energy up to say, you know what, I'm not taking this. I'm not having that. I disagree with that. Or, you know, you're not going to say that I'm not good enough. And I, that happened to me at a very early age. I remember going for trials with, with, for the England team. Uh, no, for the, for the, for, it was for the national school um, where, you, you, you know, it was the best of the best were selected. 14 kids, you went and got a great education, but you played football every day. You had to go to a boarding school. I think Cara and Michael Owen, actually, they got in. Uh, Michael, it was Lillishaw, yeah, right? Yeah, they, 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 Michael wasn't at the trial, but uh, later on down the line, Michael got into the, to the school. It was Lillishaw, the national school, mm. yes. Yeah. I, got, I, had a, I remember the, the trials were on AstroTurf. I had a terrible game. I didn't get past the first trial. Um, and that, to me, was one of the biggest, most hurtful experiences of my life. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd never been rejected from any football team. I'd never been told I was ne never good enough for any football team. So when I got that, that letter in the post to say that, you, you know, you won't be invited to the next trial, but good luck. Oh, my God. I used that energy. I used that negative, that setback in my life. And every time, you know, things were, 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 were getting bad in my life. I always thought back to that letter that came through and it gave me the strength to think I never wanted to have that feeling of, you know, not being good enough, not being um, up to scratch or, you know, so it just powered me and empowered me and filled me with mental strength. It helped me deal with setbacks. And um, in the whole, in, in life, in any industry, you're going to get setbacks on a weekly, daily basis because, to be fair, you're your only fan and there's mm. only you driving you forward to have a better life. So it's only you going to have the impact in your life. Other people are not going to give you the work. In fact, other people, you have jealousy, you have you know, a bit of bitterness from people. Nobody wants to see anybody else do well. And this is another thing about team spirit. In that Liverpool team, you see people, they all want to help each other do well. There's no yeah. jealousy, there's no envy in there, there's no bitterness. It's all heading in the one direction, which is quite unique for a team um, to be able to create that culture. But there's only you who's going to drive your life forward. So you have to make sure every day when people are trying to de destroy your confidence, they're trying to mock you or whatever they try to do to undermine your enthusiasm, you can't let it set you back. You've got to use any setbacks in your life to drive you forward and say, do you know what? I'm going to fucking show you. Mm. I think there's a really interesting part there. You spoke about the sort of culture that comes into it as, as well. Um, the, you know, there's, there's the unique aspect of everyone wanting to do well for each other during, in that Liverpool team. Look, you, you went from Liverpool to uh, uh, Coventry, Blackburn, I think Portsmouth and Wigan are, are in there as well. You, you've seen different cultures across that sort of team, and, uh, across those sort of teams. What, was, what were the differences in, in you know, the highest performing teams to, you know, to some of the ones where they struggled a little bit more? And, and, and you know, when cultures come and go, what's, what, are, what are the key things to, to put, you know, keeping that together? In, in... I, I understand completely where you're coming from there, Toby. Um, when I was, I was at Liverpool from when I was nine years old. And yeah. I considered myself a winner. I was institutionalised by Liverpool Football Club to be a winner. That's a, they were creating that mentality in me, you know, couldn't even lose a five-a-side game. I'd go home, I'd feel sick, you know, 
someone got the better of me in a game, I wouldn't be able to sleep at night. You know, that's what they created. So when I left Liverpool, I felt like I was a winner. And I was only, it was only a matter of time before I'd go on and start winning trophies, this, that, and the other. What I didn't realise is I thought every club had that. Mm. Every club in the country had that. But it wasn't. It was a unique culture. I think Manchester United had it. Uh, well, they definitely had it. Uh, Liverpool had it. Not every club after that had it. It's, uh, mm. it's a very unique, um, unique. And does that experience. come? Does that come from the club, or does that come from the players, or is it a bit? Of it both? came from the. It came. It comes from the club being successful in the past. So when you're stepping into Liverpool, you know you're stepping into a heritage and a history that's successful. It's built. The foundations are built on success, whereas other clubs are not. So their success might be survival. So when I signed for Coventry, you know, survival was a big thing then. But, and I couldn't get my head around it. You know, it's not just about surviving. We want to win things. We want to change things. Uh, you know, and this is, this is one thing what I will say is, you know, when some people say, build your dreams that big that they scare you. Yeah. You have to build your ambitions the same as well because one of the biggest things in my life was, my ambition was to be to go and play for Liverpool Football Club. After that, you have to be careful that you hit your ambition. You need to set other ambitions. I, I, I look back now with regret and thinking, you know, I achieved my ambition, but maybe I set them too low. Yeah. You know, because I, yeah. I didn't win anything in my career. And I look back and I'm filled with so much regret. That. I'm gonna have to stop. I have to stop you on that. You, you, you won the big one. One of my favourite ever games was that youth cup final. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah. But you know that that should have been the beginning for me. Um, you, you, if you just if you'd have known me from when I was nine to uh, to even even when I signed for Coventry and signed for Blackburn, I I look back at my career and I'm just I can't believe I never won things. You know, it's yeah. like. I was so driven to be successful. Um, so somewhere along the way, it it it, it just it, it evaporated. I don't know whether you know my standards got lowered or or what it was. But you know. so, do you think that that standards lowering was about being out of that particular team? Then, so so you know, when you're there and you've got that culture of winning, you move into a different you know area. I stepped out of a yeah. successful environment. That's exactly what I did. I step, stepped out of a winning, successful environment. And, um, you know, we were all singing off the same page. You know, when I look back and, you know, I was part of a group, really. I was part of a group. And that group all shared that same mentality. And when I left, you know, Liverpool went and won the treble. You know, the likes of Dan, seeing Danny Murphy and, and Cara and Stevie G and... You know, Michael lifting trophies is, is I, I was never jealous, but I was envious, you know, and I did mm. start to question my, you know, some of my choices that I made in life. Um, you know, fair play to them, but I should have been a part of that, really. But then you fought back as well, didn't you? Because it, uh, it was over at Blackburn, wasn't it, that you got into the England squad and, uh, you know, were knocking yeah. on Sven's door and all that, all, all that sort of stuff. So, so form sort of refound itself and... And look, injuries yeah, sort of you know, paid their toll at the end, didn't they? Uh, yeah, but, yeah, I think it was never about form or, or anything like that why I left Liverpool. It was just, I think there was a real big um, misunderstanding with me and Gerard Houllier. I think I was a little bit immature and I don't think he knew how to deal with me or my, um, my desire to, to be successful. I think he yeah. felt like it was a little bit uncontrollable. Um, but it wasn't. It, it 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 just needed harnessing a little bit more. So when I felt I wasn't getting the appreciation, that's why I left to go to Coventry because I knew I'd proved myself. I knew I was good enough to play for Liverpool Football Club. I knew I was good enough to play for a top club. So I thought to myself, yeah, no problem. I'll go anywhere in the world. I'll go to any club in the world and I'll prove myself. And that's what yeah. was beginning to happen when I signed for Blackburn again. I felt like I'd found a, a team and a culture and a winning mentality that, you know, was going to allow me to be successful. Unfortunately, uh, the, the injuries kicked in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's interesting that, isn't it? Because, it, it, again, you go back to, to you know, to Julio there and, and, and um, you know, did, was tremendously successful with, with uh, you know, the the, uh, the five cups and all that, that sort of stuff. But, again, it's about finding someone there who's going to find the right 
uh, way to tap into it. And I think that's probably one of the great things with Klopp is he seems to be able to get the best out of uh, out of all sorts of different people and treat them all differently. Do you, th- do you think there's coaches there who, who really get individuals as opposed to, uh, you know, coaches who probably say it's my way or the highway? Yeah, I don't think Gerard knew me. He never knew me personally. I don't know whether he took the time to try to get to know me. He was a nice enough guy and I had a lot of respect for him. But um, I don't think... It, I, I don't think it would be allowed to happen um, under Jurgen Klopp. Yeah. I think if, if I was, if if I had um, some traits in my personality that were not right or didn't fit into the team, then yeah, they'd probably get rid of me. But uh, I never had, I never showed an awkwardness or uh, anything that was unwilling to, that was not going to be contributing to be for Liverpool Football Club to be successful. I had ability. I'd done well the season before. I just think we just had too many misunderstandings, me and Gerard. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, there's a, there's there's so much I could go into, and I know that, that you've been really generous with your time. Um, this is a this is a subject which is probably one of my the two. I've, I said it in uh, something I wrote the other day. My two favourite things are uh, outside the family are, uh, are Liverpool and recruitment. So being able to talk to uh, talk to you about both of them makes it is a bit of a dream come true for me. So. Listen, I really massively appreciate every bit of insight you, you, you shared there. I think there's so much that we can take away from where it is. I am uh, so pleased we're back on the right perch again at, <laughs> at, 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 at the moment. And I'm really excited for the future. Let's, uh, let's keep on watching how it goes and hopefully we'll be able to talk again in a couple of weeks and uh, see yeah, how, we've, uh, how we've done it, done it again. But Tom, it's been brilliant speaking to you. Thanks so much for your time and uh, thanks for joining thanks us. Thanks for having me. Absolute pleasure. Thanks, thanks Tom. Take care. Bye-bye. Good luck.